Hello, and welcome to Ichthys Theater Productions' presentation of A Dickens of a Time. Before we begin, a word, if I may. The current global pandemic has affected theaters all across the world, and all of us here at Ichthys have felt the effects firsthand. We find ourselves in a precarious position as we enter the new year, and we ask that you, the viewer at home, or wherever you are, to help us to meet our everyday obligations during this time of lockdown. This is why we have set up a GoFundMe page at the address currently on your screen. You can also find the link in the description and on our Facebook page. Please, help support community theater with whatever you can afford. Any little bit helps. And please feel free to donate at any point during the show. Oh, and one more thing. The performance you are about to watch was filmed with proper COVID and social distancing protocols in place, as you can see in these images. Masks were worn at all times, except when the cameras were rolling. We all stayed safe so we could bring you this show, so please, do yourself a favor and stay safe for us. We thank you in advance and hope you enjoy the show. Charles Dickens at your service. I am pleased you've joined me and my troop of actor friends as we present a small play that I have written. Now, it's called A Christmas Carol, even though it's not a song, and it's not even about a song. So, we are ready, and if you are ready, then let's have a Dickens of a time. Whatsoever about it. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the undertaker, and the chief mourner, Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. The proper papers had been sent to the government, and so it was official. Marley was dead. Dead as a doornail, dead as a coffin nail, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, dead. And Scrooge knew he was dead with absolute certainty. Marley had been his partner for decades, and when he died, Scrooge had been his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole beneficiary, his sole friend, and his sole mourner. Scrooge had never had Marley's name removed from the sign on the door. He deemed it an unnecessary expense. So there it had stood for years now. Scrooge and Marley brokerage. Sometimes new clients called him Morley, but he answered nevertheless. It was the same to him. Oh, Scrooge was a tight-fisted, nose-to-the-grindstone investment broker. A squeezing, wrenching, Grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous, old son of a banker. He was oblivious to the heat or the cold of the weather. Nor could the elements cheer him up with sunny warmth or chill him any more than he already was. No wind blew more bitter or biting than he. No pelting rain was more pitiless than he. 
the heaviest rain or snow had only one advantage over Scrooge. They came down in abundance. Scrooge never did. He prided himself on never wasting time or money on frivolous things. He read only the business-oriented newspapers and voted the straight Tory ticket. He wrote letters to the editor with dire warnings of burgeoning government deficits and the need for, and he liked this part, austerity in government spending. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to chat, invite him to come for a visit, or have lunch with them. His scowl and aggressive stride warned off all smiles, all entreaties for donations to a good cause, all inquiries for directions. Even dogs pulled on their leashes to get out of his way. But Scrooge didn't care. In fact, he liked it that way. When people stayed out of his way, he could accomplish much more. He was always thinking of ways to take advantage of the stock market. Or whether he should call in a loan he was in danger of losing to a client's bankruptcy. He kept a watchful eye out for struggling but fundamentally sound businesses, which he could buy out cheaply and add to his portfolio. And thus it was that Scrooge came to be sitting in his office poring over the business section late one Christmas Eve. It was a cold, bleak, gray afternoon, and the lamp on his desk cast a small pool of light in the dimness of the room. His clerk, Bob Cratchit, sat in his tiny cubicle, checking figures in the ledger book. And oh, it was cold in the office. Scrooge kept the thermostat low to reduce the heating bills and to keep his clerk alert. The man dressed warmly, but still, by the end of the day, he was frozen. Suddenly, the door flew open. It was his nephew, Fred. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God bless you. Bah, humbug. Christmas? A humbug, Uncle. Surely you don't mean that. I do. What's Christmas time but a time for buying too much on credit and paying bills with no money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer for balancing your books and coming up in the red. If I had my way, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own Christmas pudding and buried with a steak of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew! You keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But, but you don't keep it. Well, then let me leave it alone. What good has celebrating Christmas ever gained for you? Oh. There are many things from which I have gained good, though not a profit, and, and Christmas is among them. I've always thought of Christmas, apart from the wonder and joy of the birth of Christ, as a good time, a kind, giving, and forgiving time. The only time in the whole world where everyone opens their hearts freely and thinks of others less fortunate as fellow travelers on the road of life and not some alien race. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a dime in my pocket, I believe that Christmas has done me good and always will do me good. And I say, God bless Christmas! Hey! Let me hear another sound from you and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your job. Well, you're quite a powerful speaker, Fred. You should have been a politician. <laughs> Heavens no. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come and have Christmas dinner with us tomorrow. We'd love to have you. And why did you get married against my advice? You can't afford a wife and a home yet. Oh, because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. <laughs> Good afternoon. Oh, un but Uncle, you never came to see me when I got married, even beforehand. Why give it as a reason for not coming now? Good Afternoon. Uncle Scrooge, I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. 
Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I'm sorry to find you so determined. I don't know how I have offended you, but I come in the spirit of Christmas to invite you to dinner, and I'll keep my Christmas spirit to the last. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a happy new year. Good afternoon. Is Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley in? Sir, sir, there are two gentlemen here to see you. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead for seven years. In fact, he died seven years ago this very night. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm so, so sorry. sorry. Why? We all have to die sometime. We're not like suppose so, sir. Well, what do you want? At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make a small provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly during these days. Yes, um, so many thousands are in need of the common necessities. Um, hundreds of thousands are in need of the common comfort, sir. Um, what with the lack of affordable housing and low wages, unemployment... Well, are there no homeless shelters? No food banks? I'm sure the welfare rolls are still bloated. But they can scarcely furnish Christian cheer to everyone. Indeed, so a few of us are endeavoring to raise funds for the Christmas Baskets program. Yes, uh, we choose this time of year because it is a time above all other times when poverty is felt most keenly. And uh, the rest of us, we have so much to share. So, um, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, you wish to re remain anonymous? I wish to be left alone. And I mind my business, and I suggest that you and the poor do the same. I don't make myself merry at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry either. I help to support the welfare system through my taxes, and they cost enough. And those who are badly off should just get a job or do without. But many can't make their wages a welfare stretch, especially at Christmas. And many of the working poor, they're so proud. They would rather die. Well, if they would rather die, then they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. But, sir, you don't mean that. What of the children? Why should the innocent wish you a Merry Christmas? And why should I suffer through all this racket? Get out! Get out! Oh, sponges. Oh, coming in here. tomorrow. Please, if it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to dock your pay for it, you would consider yourself mightily hard done by, I dare say. Well, yes, sir. And yet you don't think me hard done by to pay a day's wages for no work? It's only once a year, sir, and it is Christmas. Even the stock exchanges and the banks will be closed, and all the other brokerage houses will be closed, too. There'd be nothing to do. <laughs> a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December? Ugh, but I suppose you must have the whole day off. I'll be here all the earlier the next day. We will need to make up the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I will, sir. And Merry Christmas. Oh, bah! Humbug! Humbug! Cratchit was out the door in a flash and raced for home sliding down a sheet of ice in honor of Christmas Eve. It was already six o'clock, and his family was waiting. Scrooge, meanwhile, took his grumpy self along the streets to have his solitary dinner at the local pub. It was virtually deserted, but the management had kept his usual table in the back corner waiting for him. His meal of a hot beef sandwich Vegetables, rice pudding, and a black coffee came immediately. 
that being his standing order. He ate silently and steadily. Then he sat back with his second cup and perused the papers. At seven, he rose, paid his bill, gave the waitress a curt nod for a tip, and left for home. Home was an apartment in a downtown building once owned by his partner, Jacob Marley. They were cavernous, gloomy rooms above rented offices. There was nothing unusual about the knocker on the door, except that it was rather large, and of course, Scrooge had seen it every night and morning for the last seven years. And yet, this night, as he fitted his key in the lock, he saw not the knocker, but Marley's face. It looked at Scrooge, not angrily or ferociously, but just looked at him. Now, Scrooge was a man of no imagination. So he merely stared fixedly at the phenomenon until it was a knocker again. Humbug! Humbug! The slamming of the door seemed to echo and re-echo throughout the building. But Scrooge was not the kind to be, uh, I guess, frightened by echoes. He simply walked upstairs to his apartment, turning out lights as he went. <laughs> Darkness is cheap. But after he went into his own rooms, he had just enough of a twinge of uneasiness about Marley's face in the door knocker that he walked about checking to see everything was all right. And sure enough, living room, bedroom, and bathroom were all as they should be. Nobody was under the table, the sofa, or in the closet. Satisfied, he sat down on the edge of his bed to take off his shoes, wearily took off his jacket and tie, put on his dressing gown and slippers. Scrooge suddenly heard a clanking noise. It seemed to be everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It grew louder and more ominous with every second. Then it was at his door and bursting into his apartment. It was Jacob Marley. It was the same face he had seen but a moment ago in the door knocker. It was Marley, all right. He wore the same suit and tie he had for years. But his eyes, his eyes were death cold and bored right through Scrooge. Oh. What do you want with me? Much. Well, who are you? Ask me who I was. Well, who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Oh, I don't believe in you. You don't believe in me? I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I, I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing can affect them. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy about you than the grave, whatever you are. Humbug! Ah! Oh, mercy, dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Very little time is permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. You are wrapped in chains. Why? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard. I fashioned it out of the selfish commercial existence of my own free choice. And now I can never be free of it. No more than you can ever be free of yours, your chain, when that time comes. 
It was as heavy and as long as mine seven Christmases ago, and you have labored on it since nonstop, so that now it is almost beyond measure! I, I, I have seen no chain! I was never aware of mine until the, the moment I died. My spirit never walked beyond our money, our, our brokerage firm. Mark me! In life, my spirit never roamed beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And now weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and, and traveling all the time? Does that chain not slow you down? I ride on the wings of the wind. There is no rest, no peace, just incessant torture of remorse. But you are a good person, Marley. Good person? I had no concept of goodness. I did not know that any Christian spirit working kindly in this world would find its mortal life far too short for all its possibilities of usefulness. I did not know that no amount of eternal regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. I wasted my life. I was blind. Well, but you are a good man of business, Jacob. Business! Um, Mankind was my business! The common welfare was my business! Charity, mercy, forbearance, benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Calm down, Jacob. Hear me. My time is nearly gone. I'll hear you. I'll hear you. Don't be so hard on me. I am here tonight to warn you that you still have a chance and a hope of escaping my fate. A chance that I have arranged for you, Ebenezer. Oh, oh you always... A good friend, Jacob. Thank you. You will be haunted by three spirits. What? If that's the chance, uh, I, I, I think I'll pass. Without their visits, you cannot hope to escape the path I tread. You will continue like all the others, racing through life, eyes shut to the truly important. Expect the first spirit tomorrow night, when the bell strikes one. Expect the second the next night, at the same hour, the third spirit on the next night will come at a time of its own choosing. Oh, couldn't I just take them all at once and um, get it over? Ah! Look to see me no more. Look to the misery around you and do something about it while there's still time. Save yourself! Scrooge followed the ghost to his window through which it had vanished. Even as he checked to see it was closed and locked, he could hear the rattle of its chains echo in the night air. He shivered and hugged his dressing gown closer. He was profoundly disturbed by his visitor, and even his usual bluster wouldn't return and dispel the foreboding he felt. Oh, oh, bugger. Suddenly, he was so very tired. Perhaps it was the unaccustomed emotion that he had experienced, or the fatigue of the day, or his glimpse of the spirit world in its darkness, or even simply the lateness of the hour. For it was past two in the morning. He lay down without undressing, and went straight to sleep. The silent night, the holy night of Christmas Eve, passed into the early hours of Christmas Day, when suddenly a mystery began to unfold. For though it was past two in the morning, the clock on Scrooge's mantle suddenly struck one. One o'clock? Well, I'm sure it was 
after two when I went to bed? Or did I dream that? Did I dream about Marley too? I'm sure I've only been asleep a short time. <clears throat> oh. oh! Oh! Are you the spirit that Marley told me about? I am. Well, who, 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 who and, the, and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. The things you will see with me are shadows of the events and people that have been, so they will not be aware of us. What is your business with me? Your welfare. Come with me. But it's cold outside, and I've barely slept a week. I don't even have my slippers on. Where are we going? Shouldn't I get dressed? Do you always complain this much? Oh, don't be impertinent. And why do you have a young face? You said you were Christmas past. My robe may be yellowed with time, but the spirit of Christmas is forever young, forever living. <laughs> Convenient story. Recognize this place? Good grief. That's me at school. That dreadful boarding school. I had no friends. I was always left alone on holidays. Everyone else went home, but not me. Ebenezer! Eb! I've come to take you home! Fan! Home, Fan? Yes, home! Dad is so much kinder now. So last night, when he seemed in a particularly good mood, Maybe it was the Christmas spirit. I asked him if you could come home. And he said yes. Father said yes. Till when? Till forever. You don't ever have to come back here. You'll never be lonely again. You'll have real friends. Friends? I, I don't believe it. it. It really is Christmas. The best Christmas ever. Come on, let's get you packed and go home. Lovely girl, your sister. Yes. Oh, she was a light in this dark world. She died young. Giving birth to her first child. As your mother died giving birth to you. Yes. My father never really forgave me. And your sister's child? My nephew, Fred. I promised to look out for him. I didn't. I guess I blamed him for taking her from me. Forgive me, Fan. I'm just like my father, aren't I? I wish... Yes? Nothing. There were some children singing carols at my office today. I'm afraid I was quite nasty to them and I frightened them off. Shall we visit another Christmas? Do you recognize this man? Oh, Fezziwig! Why, it's old Fezziwig! <laughs> I had my first job with him! Ebenezer? Ebenezer? No more work tonight, Ebenezer. It's, it's Christmas. Close up shop and let's get ready for our party. Merry Christmas, everyone. Let the dancing begin. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He has merely spent a few coins, and he deserves such praise. Oh, it isn't that spirit. He had the power to make us happy or sad, to make our work heavy or light, a pleasure or a toil. He used words of encouragement and smiles and, and wonderful Christmas parties to give us happiness as great as if he had spent a fo fortune. Oh. What's the matter? Oh. I should like to be able to say something to my clerk just now. <laughs> Our time is short. We must move on. Ebenezer? Ebenezer, we need to talk. You don't love me any longer. You don't even seem to care about me. Belle Fezziwig. What are you talking about? Another mistress has replaced me. If 
You can find comfort in her. Fine. What? Miss Mistress Money. Competition to be the newest, youngest financial big shot of the stock exchange. All of your finer aspirations have fallen by the wayside. Mistress Money rules you. Don't be silly. I have grown wiser in the ways of the world. That's all. The world is a very cruel place. In these modern times, you have to look out for yourself. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. If you don't keep on the cutting edge of the economy, you'll be crushed. Or, at the very least, left behind. I will not be poor. No wife of mine will be a penny pincher. We can't afford to be married. I'm calling off the engagement. You're free of me. What? Why? You're not the man I fell in love with. You used to say, money isn't everything. Belle, you're my wealth. Your hopes and dreams are so different now. Here's your ring back. You could sell it and cut your losses. Goodbye, Ebenezer. Follow her, you idiot! Why did you show me that spirit? Let's leave! I told you, these were the shadows of things that have been. Don't blame me for what they are. Let me go! I can't take it! Take me back! Hug me no longer! Why did I let her go? She was my light. How could I say those things to her? Oh, Belle, I'm so sorry. So sorry. I'm so sorry. And so Scrooge sank into a fitful sleep, haunted by the scenes the spirit had dredged up and forced him to confront. Other scenes intruded into his dreams. Scenes of starting his own business with Marley and the two growing rich, reliving Marley's death and Scrooge growing richer, inheriting his only friend's personal belongings and wealth. Jacob on his deathbed, clutching Scrooge's arm and croaking wildly, save yourself! When Scrooge awoke, his whole dreary apartment seemed transformed. Everything was hung with greenery, and the shiny leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected such a light that the whole place seemed ablaze with glory. One might think the Christmas star had come down to rest in Scrooge's quarters. Heaped upon the floor, to form a kind of throne, were roast turkeys and geese, mincemeat and pumpkin pies, steaming plum puddings, bowls of fresh fruit and nuts in the shell, piles of Christmas cake and great bowls of punch. Amongst the feast of Christmas fare stood a giant, resplendent in red and crowned with a wreath of holly. Ha, ha, ha! Ebony's old boy! Come here, get to know me. You stranger, I am the ghost of Christmas present. You've never seen the likes of me before, I wager. Oh, never. And I wish the pleasure had been indefinitely postponed. Are you still unmoved by what you have seen? No, but I am too old to change. Go and redeem some young fellow. Leave me to keep Christmas in my own way. We spirits of Christmas do not live only one day of the year. We live the whole 365. Jesus, whose birth Christmas celebrates, desires to live in men's hearts not just one day of the year, but all the days of the year. You have chosen not to let him live in your life, and therefore, you will come with me, and, and we will seek him in the hearts of people of good will. They shall show you how to keep Christmas. Where are we going? To the lavish home of one Robert Cratchit. Perhaps you know him? He owes all of his opulence and sumptuous Christmas dinner to 
his most generous employer. Ready? It will cost you nothing, which I am sure is good news to you. Oh. <laughs> Do I have to talk to them? Will they be able to see me? No, they will not be able to see you, which I'm sure will be good news to them. <laughs> Wherever is your father in Tiny Tim? And Martha wasn't this late last Christmas. I'm here. Sorry to be late. Oh, bless you, Martha. What kept you so late? Oh, we had so many orders to get done for Christmas. We didn't get them finished, even with overtime on Christmas Eve. So they made us come in this morning and finish them before they would let us leave for Christmas. Oh, Martha, you poor dear, we've got to get you out of that factory. But you are home now and it's Christmas. Oh, sit down and relax. Faster, faster, horsey. Father's coming with Tiny Tim. Hide, Martha, and surprise him. Whoa, this horsey's done in. Merry Christmas, everyone. Oh, Merry Christmas. Where's Martha? Not coming. Not coming? It's Christmas. I'm going down to that factory. Here I am, Father. I wouldn't miss Christmas for anything. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Peter and Belinda, please take Tiny Tim to get washed up for dinner. The turkey's nearly ready. Martha, will you check on the Christmas pudding? How was Tiny Tim at the service this morning? Oh, he was as good as gold. He gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. And he comes out with the strangest things. You know what he told me on the way home? He hoped that people saw him in church because it might remind them on Christmas Day of who made the lame walk and the blind to see. But I do believe he grows stronger every day. Spirit, what about Tiny Tim? Is he getting stronger? I see a vacant chair at the table and a crutch without an owner, unless these visions are altered by the future. No! No! What's it to you? If he dies, he decreases the surplus population. One less beggar, lower taxes. The pudding is almost ready and the turkey is done to turn. Father, you haven't made the Christmas punch yet. Oops, slipping on my job here. Time for the turkey. Best turkey in the city. The country. Awfully small bird for such a family. A toast to start this fine feast. Merry Christmas to all. God bless. God bless us. God bless us, everyone. To Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Oh, the founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, and it's Christmas Day. Well, it should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, when one would drink the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge, and you, of all people, should know it, Bob. It's Christmas Day, dear. Well, I'll drink his health for your sake, and because it's Christmas, not for his sake. Long life to him, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, no doubt. To Mr. Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge. Actually, I think Mr. Scrooge is less fortunate than us. What? Think about it. He has no family, no one but his own company and his own voice. No warmth of Christmas spirit in that. Time to say grace and enjoy this wondrous feast. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food so lovingly prepared. Thank you for our home and our family and for Christmas Day. We ask for your blessing. Amen. Amen. Bob, I, I meant to... Your money's no good here. You have cut yourself off from them. Uh, but can't I help? I suppose you want the whole day off? You'd feel yourself hard done by if I docked you a day's pay? Condemned by my own words! May I suggest that in the future you refrain from such statements as reducing the surplus population until you have discovered what that surplus is and where it is. Will you decide? 
who shall live or who shall die. It may be that in the sight of heaven, you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like that poor man's child. But I didn't know. I didn't realize. I didn't think about Did it. Did you ever try to get to know Cratchit personally? Did you ever ask after his family? I didn't think to ask. I had no idea. I didn't know. Come, you odd little man. Your journey is far from finished. There is much more for you to see. We go now to another home in the city. You know it well, though you have never stepped foot inside it. And he said that Christmas was a humbug. And he was absolutely serious. Shame on him. What's he like? I actually find him a funny old man, though he's definitely not as pleasant as he might be, but he punishes himself mostly, so I have nothing to say against him. I mean, who suffers by his negative outlook? Himself. If he decides to dislike us and won't come to Christmas dinner, what's the consequence? He loses out on a marvelous dinner and excellent company. I intend to invite him every year, and he can refuse every year if he likes. Oh, let's forget about him. He spoils the Christmas spirit. Let's play 21 questions. An excellent suggestion. I'll go first. Let me think. I've got it. <laughs> first question. Is it living? Yes. Is it an animal? Yes. Is it a tame animal? Yes. Well, no. Well, well, sort of. Well, is it savage? Yes. Well, it's it's pretty fierce most of the time. Does it make a noise? Yes, lots. Does it bark? Uh, no. Well, does it meow? Oh, definitely not. Well, that rules out cats. Does it howl? No. Growl? Or grunt? Yes, both. He's got them stumped now. Is it a bear? <laughs> no, no. Does it live in a jungle? No. In the zoo? No. Well, yes, in some ways it does. Well, what does that mean? Oh, I get it. Does it live in the city? Yes. Oh, that's very clever, but my friend's as sharp as a tack. Does it walk the streets, then? Is that what you mean? Yes. Does someone lead it, then? You said it was an animal. Oh, definitely not. Well, then it can't be a dog or a horse. Oh. Is it sold in the marketplace? No, but it's often found in the halls of commerce. Is it sociable? <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, how many questions is that? Twenty. Friends one. Oh, I forgot to keep count. I'll give you a chance to guess what it is. I know. What? <laughs> it's the tax man. It's Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy that game? <laughs> Though if you ask me, the reply to the question, is it a bear, should have been yes. Oh, it is good to be children sometimes, and, and never better than at Christmas, when its mighty founder was a child himself. But my time is running short, and, and yet there are so many other places you should visit. They're right here in the city, but you never see them. You ignore them. You know what Belle is doing right now? Belle? She is well then? Oh, how is she? She is a most happy creature. She works at the homeless shelters and soup kitchens. She shares her love with strangers because you would not share your life with her. She loves children such as these. They are want and ignorance. Their sisters and brothers are everywhere and their numbers increase. Have they no help? Are there no shelters? Are there no bloated welfare rules? No food, no shelters, no food, no shelters. Well, I, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, you are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. I fear you more than either of the others. Will you not speak to me? I know Marley sent you to help me become the different man, and so I will go with you. Thankfully, though, 
fearfully. Lead on. Well, I don't know any details except a key one. He's dead. Well, when did he die? Last night, I heard. What's, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. So did he, I bet. Most importantly. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard about that. What happened to the company? There's no family. I bet you the old skinflint is worth millions. <laughs> When's the funeral? You going? Someone should represent the exchange. Flip you for it. Ha! Heads! You lose! Oh! I know those men! They are important, wealthy men of business. Members of the exchange, my very good friends. It's important to be on good terms with them. But where am I? This is the floor of the exchange and I'm, I'm always here at this time. You can't miss out on a day's trading. Spirit, what's going on? Who was the dead man they were talking about? Everyone has a right to take care of themselves. He always did. Just following his example. That's right. He taught us good. And who's the worst for the loss of these few things? Not a dead man. He don't need them anymore. Not where he's going. <laughs> if he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he more sociable when he was alive? <laughs> Found this nice ring at the back of a drawer. Obviously didn't mean much to him, but some young woman would love it. If he was more human, he wouldn't have had... He would have had somebody to look after him when he took ill. Instead, he had to lie there all by himself, gasping out his last breath. It's a judgment on him. It should have been a heavier judgment. and would have been if I could have laid my hands on anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this man? Such disrespect is horrifying. Does no one care? Who is he? The case of this poor man might be my own. My life is like that. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with this death. Is there no one who cares about him? There must be something positive in this story, or it will haunt me forever. And Jesus took the little child and set him in the midst of the crowd and he said to them, Unless you become like a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wherever is your father? It must be close to his time. Long past it, really. But I think he has walked a little slower these last few evenings. I've known him to walk very fast with Tiny Tim on his shoulder. He was so very light to carry it. Your father loved him, so... It there was no burden, no, no trouble at all. Hello? Dad, you're home. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. The turkey smells delicious. And Martha, did you help with the pudding? I made it all by myself She's this year. Good job. Good job. You were gone a long time, Dad. Yes, I went to visit our little one. I wish you could all have been there. It would have done you good to see how pleasant and a beautiful place it is. There's a big shade tree you could sit under and talk to him. Oh, my little boy, my tiny Tim, my tiny Tim, my little boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Spirit, why did the boy have to die? Could nothing have been done to save him? And Spirit, who was that dead man? Spirit, talk to me. Oh, no. Spirit, before I look at that tombstone, please answer me just one question. Have you shown me the things that will happen or only may happen? Men's lives foreshadow certain things happening if they persist in living the way they have chosen. But if they change their ways, 
Surely the results will change. Please tell me that it is possible to change what I see. Don't cut me off from this hope. It's too black. Black as hell! Ebenezer Scrooge! No, spirit! No! So I was the dead man. The one my colleagues were talking about. The one my housekeeper and Mrs. Dilbo robbed. Oh, spirit, please tell me there is hope. Hear me. I'm not the man I was. I've changed. The visits of the spirits have shown me how wrong I've been. Why show me this if I am beyond all hope? Please. Please tell me I can change the future by changing my life now. I will honor Christmas in my heart and keep it all year round. I will live in the past, the present, and the future, remembering all the lessons the spirits have taught me. Oh, please tell me I can wipe away the writing on that stone. Oh, God, please, please give me a second chance. Please. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So sorry. He won't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Now, where's a pen and paper? What's their address? Oh, <laughs> I have so much to do. I have so much to do. <laughs> so Scrooge dressed himself in all his best and went out into the streets, greeting people he met. He could hardly restrain himself from hugging each one. And his smile was so engaging that everyone smiled back at him and wished him a Merry Christmas. It was the most wonderful sound he had ever heard. He met the two gentlemen who had been soliciting donations for the Christmas baskets program and gleefully gave them a rather large check. Pass the present dues, he called. 
In the afternoon, he made his way to his nephew Fred's house. Would he still be welcome for Christmas dinner? He was at the door and turned away three times before he mustered up his courage and knocked. Well, once the shock wore off, Fred and his wife and their dinner guests welcomed him warmly. He had a wonderful time, a wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful fellowship, and wonderful happiness. But he was early at his office the next morning. He wanted to be sure to be there before Bob and catch him coming in late. He had his heart set up, and he did it. Nine o'clock, no Bob. 9.15, still no Bob. Scrooge was delighted. At 18 and a half minutes past, he heard scrambling footsteps in the hall and quickly wiped the smile off his face. By the time Bob sneaked in, Scrooge was scowling into a notebook. Well, what do you mean by coming in at this time of day? I'm very sorry, sir. I am late. But we were making rather merry yesterday, and the most extraordinary thing happened. <laughs> Step over here, please. It's only once a year, sir. It won't happen again. You're right. It won't happen again. And I'm not going to stand for this sort of thing any longer. And therefore... But, sir... I'm going to raise your salary. What? Christmas, Bob, <laughs> and a merrier Christmas than I have ever given you. I am raising your salary, and we are going to discuss benefits and holidays over a cup of tea. <laughs> now, turn up the thermostat, Bob. It's cold in here. <laughs> and tomorrow, we're going over our records to restructure or forgive some of the loans we have out. Nope, nope. On second thought, take tomorrow off. <laughs> and we'll start the next day. <laughs> oh, oh, on third thought, I think I should make you my manager of corporate affairs, which comes with an even higher salary. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> hey, let's go tell your family. <laughs> I don't deserve to be so happy. <laughs> and Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a boss, and as good a man as the city ever knew, or anyone ever knew in the whole wide world. Some people laughed to see how he had changed, but he didn't care. His own heart laughed. Now and that was enough for him.
Wow. That was... That was something special, wasn't it? Hi. I'm Rob Kerwin. I was the director of filming, I was the editor, and among other things, I was part of the cast of the show that you just watched, A Dickens of a Time. I won't lie to you, and I think you can agree with me that this year has been difficult. Global pandemic has taken its toll on a lot of things that we love, and theater is among them, especially here at ICFAS. That's why we're looking for your support. This show almost didn't happen, but we sat down, hashed out the details, and we made it happen, and we did it safely. So if you wouldn't mind, we've set up a GoFundMe page. You can see the link on your screen right now. If you give us a hand, we really would appreciate it. Help us see the new year and bring you more great shows like the one you just watched. Anything helps, honestly. This is Rob Kerwain saying thank you for watching. Please donate and have a Merry Christmas.